destruction. In the center of the square stood the monument commemorating the martyrs of the revolution, a tombstone of the great dead, which consecrates the square as sacred ground. The monument depicts scenes from China's history since 1840. There are no recognizable individuals. Collectively, they represent the people. Among the ancestors of New China pictured on the monument are the students of May 4th, 1919, protesting before the gate itself. When the students of 1989 occupied Tiananmen Square, they made their headquarters here, beneath images of other students who changed China's history. They were consciously associating themselves with the tradition of student protest in China. By their own actions, they were adding further meaning to this place, the place in all of China most charged with meaning. Good morning, beloved Peking. Good morning, beloved Tiananmen, gate of heavenly peace. In Mao's era, Tiananmen became the symbol of the new China, the gate and the square, the people, and the leader who expressed the people's will. Tiananmen had once led into the imperial palace. Now, it was the focus of Mao's square. Mao and Tiananmen were one. Tiananmen Square became completely entangled with the lives of the Chinese people. This was because under the Communist Party, everyone's life became involved with politics. When I graduated from university in 1966, I sincerely believed what I was taught, that I was a brand new boat to be used in the construction of the great mansion of communism. I was willing to be put wherever my country needed me, and I was prepared to stay in place my whole life. To me, Mao was like God. I believed that he was not only the great leader of the Chinese people, but also the great leader of people throughout the world. I feared the day when he would no longer be with us. I really hoped there'd be a scientific breakthrough that would enable young people like us to voluntarily give up a year of our lives to add a minute to his. That way, the world would be saved. In 1976, Mao died between an earthquake and a solar eclipse, traditional portents of the end of an era. At the funeral, the great throng faced Tiananmen, but the place where Mao had stood was empty. All of the leaders remained on a platform below. Mao still resides in the square. The mausoleum built in 1977 at the south end of the square is not a tomb so much as a grand villa. It contains a huge marble armchair for the chairman and a bed too where he lies. I didn't shed a single tear when Mao died. I felt I'd been cheated. I've never visited the Mao mausoleum. It's so disgusting. Mao is dead but not gone. The great portrait that hangs on Tiananmen still presides over every parade and celebration held in the Great Square. During the student demonstrations of 1989, three men from Mao's own home province of Hunan splattered the great portrait with ink. The students immediately distanced themselves from this act. They denounced the outrage and helped arrest the men responsible. Shortly after the desecration, gale-force winds blew and torrents of rain fell on the square. Some people actually wondered, was the chairman displeased? Within hours, the portrait was replaced. But it is not only Mao's face. His vision of history, his language, his actions still loom large in China's imagination. 
Communism is actually a promise of something perfect. It's easy for people who are dissatisfied with all the imperfections of real life to be attracted to it. During the 1930s and 40s, many people were drawn to the Communist Party because they wanted to escape the ugly reality, and they longed for the promise. Throughout the first decade of the revolution, that promise had the support of large segments of society. Mao provided the vision of an ideal society, but he had little interest in the day-to-day -day work of bringing it about. That was left to his associates. Among them was Deng Xiaoping. Mao had the personality of a romantic poet. Deng's is that of a pragmatist. He's not a puritanical theoretician or an idealist. He's different from Mao in that he knows that when people are hungry, they need to eat. They can't live on poetry. During the 1950s, Mao launched wave after wave of persecutions against people who held different views. By 1959, no one dared express any dissenting opinions anymore. He had to have the last word on everything. And people would have tolerated it if his policies had worked out well. But he made a mess of things. Millions of people starved to death. So his comrades had to help patch things up. This meant a slight retreat from Mao's utopian illusions. Deng liked to quote a Sichuan proverb. It doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. If it catches mice, it's a good cat. But Mao's solution, when things went wrong, was always more revolution, not less. He saw anyone who stood between him and his masses as an enemy. He saw bureaucrats and lingering bourgeois elements undermining the original promise of the revolution. Against the government bureaucracy, Mao mobilized his masses. A fresh uprising of the people, the only source of progress. Mao called it a cultural revolution. The people were enjoying Da Min Ju, mass democracy. Chaos can't harm us, he proclaimed. It can only harm our enemies. Mao lost control of the cultural revolution. It became a war of all against all. Deng Xiaoping was among those attacked. Mao stripped him of his power, then brought him back to repair a shattered society. Like those in power who had experienced Mao's mass democracy, Deng Xiaoping's greatest fear would be Dong Luan, turmoil, chaos, upheaval. When the students of 1989 took to the streets, they too were branded as stirring up Dong Luan. Many leaders in the government saw them in the light of the past. They were a throwback to the horrors of the Cultural Revolution that had nearly destroyed China. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese economy was on the verge of bankruptcy. What could be done? Now here's where Deng Xiaoping was really smart. His prescription was capitalism. Reform and opening up actually meant learning from capitalism. But he couldn't say that outright, because capitalism was supposed to be our arch enemy. Now how could you turn around and learn from our enemy?